tell us about this, Jim. This is the live Johnny Winter record. Yeah. Is this what I started describing before? Yeah. Uh, you know, it was at uh, Fillmore and... 1970? Or? I think it was maybe still 69. Was it? it could have been 70. It's all a blur. Yeah. But... Um, Good morning, little schoolgirl. Yeah. Um, well, those were the days, you know, the Fillmore was the place in yeah. New York. How big of a room was it? Oh, it was a big theater. Right, maybe 5,000 or a little smaller? You know, I never was good about the numbers, but as big as, as, big as they had. Like it, as big as the Chicago Theater? Yeah, yeah. There's a different group now. Okay. This is Catfish. Which this was a Columbia Records, or it actually at A&R Studios. Well, if I'm not wrong, one of your biggest hits, Jim, is I dial your cell phone. We'll hear it on your ringer. Yeah. Was uh, Free Ride by Edgar Winter. Free Ride, come on. <laughs> Gee, that's you, Dave. <laughs> so, I wish. I wish it was me playing. So that was, uh, what, number one, top ten? It's a pretty big hit, wasn't it? It was a pretty big hit. Apparently it never went gold. Huh. Uh, even I've spoken to gold record people, manufacturing people, and they said, oh, of course it went gold. And then they look it up and they go, oh, I don't see it in here. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, you would think it is because, I mean, Kevin Eubanks played it every night as a lead out to uh, commercial breaks on the, on the, uh, Leno's right. shows and it was in movies there was a movie in the 90s or something that it's in this, but that's an entirely remixed new version of it. Right, so you engineered This is the original single that ended up on an album that uh, Edgar released that Pete Weiss engineered the album of, so I don't get credit on it it looks like Pete did it mm -hmm. I actually did this recording and I I remember we mixed this at the record plant mm -hmm. in Studio A of the record plant, East Coast, uh, 44th Street. And uh, we spent the night working on it, and somewhere in the middle of it, the console, the, the uh, Spectrosonics console blew up. And I called up Penn Stevens, the, the chief technician, and I said, Penn, what are we going to do? The studio just died in the middle of the mix. And he said, just move over to Studio B is all you can do. So we moved to Studio B, and at that point, I talked them into playing a new, a second keyboard to that, that the psychedelic mm -hmm. keyboard thing that's in the bridge or in the instrumental section with mm -hmm. a breakdown. So I got I talked him into doing that. So that's in stereo, you know. That's uh -huh. just more action going on in there. But I remember Ricky was just pacing back and forth, freaking out that we had to get this record done because he needed to get it out. Rick produced it. Yeah. So he was just I mean passing back and forth in front of the console. I remember that it was probably four or five o'clock in the morning. It was 1974, uh -huh. uh, June. No May. 13th, I think it was, because I have a notebook yeah. I found, and there was the appointment for that session, the mix session in it. So, uh, and then, oh, I saw, uh, I saw Ricky on Park Avenue one day, walking out, I was going to Columbia Records, and I said, I heard the record on the radio the other day, is that, is that our mix is that we the one I mixed, and he said absolutely. He says of course. So, you know that's that's my only validation that it that it was my record is because the only other place it exists is on Pete Weiss's album. Uh -huh. So there's no they never gave you credit on 45 records, and that I certainly mo bitched and moaned about that a lot at Columbia. Right. I mean, if I was ever politically active. <laughs> it was about engineering credits. I mean, Don Palouse did Sly Stone, he did uh, Chicago, and clients that he would book him to do sessions would still come in and say, why don't you record it this way, why don't you mic it this way, and I'd go, how could they do that? 
you've had giant hits with these people and they still want to tell you how to do it. Right, right. So, uh, you know, I've always had issues about that. With free ride, when you were working on it, listening to it, mixing it, did you have any inkling it was going to, did you think maybe this is going to be a hit? Sounds like a hit? No, but I, 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 to tell you the truth, at that period of my life, a lot of things I was doing was on the radio. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty exciting. I did some things with a group called Sugar Shop that was on the radio and they were on television doing it. Uh, Tom Rush's records were out. Dreams with uh, Doug Lubon and Jeff Kent and Billy Cobham and the Brecker Brothers. Mm -hmm. The, those cuts were yeah. on the radio all the time. I yeah. had a lot of things going on in the radio, so it was just typical. Yeah, yeah. And but I never knew it would be as long-lasting and recognizable as it is. I mean, there's almost nobody that I can say. Do you ever hear a free ride? And they go, "What's that?" You know, the mountain is high, valley is low, and they go, "Oh yeah, that record." Yeah. <laughs> No matter what country they're from, they know that record. Yeah. And yet it's not gold. You know? Wow. So one one artist you mentioned that I, I didn't know you worked with was Joe Cocker. Joe Cocker. Uh, I was working with Al Cooper from Blood, Sweat, sure. the original Blood, Sweat and Tears at a and r Studios. Still for Columbia Records, but we were using the, their studios to work in. Charlie Colello was the arranger. Uh, and... He said, Jimmy, I'm not coming in Wednesday night. Danny Cordell asked me if he could have my studio time to bring Joe Cocker in because Joe Cocker, George Harrison wrote a song for Joe Cocker, mm -hmm. and Joe's coming in to try it out. I said, great. So they come in. I get the band going, and you know, there's, and uh, it was organ and guitar and bass and drums. And I got all that set up and ready. Denny Cordell and I don't know if it was Michael Lang, but there was another guy there. And they pretty much just sat at the console like this. <laughs> Through the whole night. They never talked. They never said anything. And they just go like, try it again or something like that. But anyway, they brought Joe in. Two roadies or something. Carried him into the studio. Walked him into the studio. He was kind of like this, you know. And put him in front of the vocal mic and the vocal booth. So I went into the vocal booth and I went, hey Joe, how you doing? And set the mic up in front of him. I said, I'm glad you, glad you could come and great working with you and all that. And, you know, he didn't have much <laughs> to say. And the band starts playing the track. And uh, we did about mm, Four or five takes, I guess, maybe more. I, I don't really remember. But we we worked for a few hours in the studio, and and then, you know, I gave them a mix and the, and the multi tracks, and they left. Mm -hmm. And that's all I ever heard about it. And then, so let me see if I can find that one in here. Uh, may not even be on this. I don't see it in here. I think I added it later. I don't know. But anyway, the song was something. So fast forward six months. Mm -hmm. This is 16, May 15th or something, 69. I come down the elevator after having done this group called Catfish, and the elevator door opens up, and Simon and Garfunkel are standing by the, by the coffee machine. You know, sort of just leaning there. And they go, hey, Jimmy. What are you doing? I said, nothing. I said, I just finished this Catfish album. I said, it's the fast al fastest album I ever did. Three days. We're done. Yeah. We did that over at a and Studios. So I said, well, you know, our friends, the Beatles, just <laughs> sent us a pre-release copy of their new album. We're going to listen to it. You want to come in and listen to it with us? I said, yeah, I, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So I go in and, you know, Lou Waxman, the machine man, puts, the, you know, we had separate machine rooms where there was a guy who ran the machines, mm -hmm. and I worked the board, and then it would be another guy who was the attendant who set up the mics and things, and then he would tweak the mics. It was union, you know, so yeah. I'd be EW, Local 1212, so there was a system for it. And anyway, so I was sitting there, 
and the first song comes on is Come Together. Yeah. So that's how I heard Abbey Road for the first time. And I remember, I mean, Paul and Artie were sort of sitting at the console, and it's over, and they just sort of turned like this and looked at each other and just stood up and walked out of the room. Yeah. And I remember that the, when the last song, uh, you know, the love you take is equal to the love you give, or whatever. Right. And Lou was ready to stop the machine. I said, no, I said, I know there's something else on it. And boom, Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl comes on. I said, yes, I knew it. I love that they always gave you what you thought they were going to give you. There's some special extra thing that was on there. Right. You know, it's probably, what, 10 but, seconds. And then did you hear something? Oh, and that, <laughs> right, that's right. Thank you, Dave. That's when I heard something, and I said, that's what Al was talking about. George Harrison's doing something. So he wrote that song, supposedly, for Joe Cocker? That's, yeah, six months before, that's what the story was, is that's wow. why he came in. And, okay, fast forward five years later, I'm in the Valley after the show with Manhattan Transfer, my first time out in, uh, in California in Hollywood, we had just done the Roxy and we went to a party in the Valley. I'm sitting, I'm hanging out with Tim, uh, Tim Hauser and Alan Paul. Uh, I don't know if Janice and, uh, and uh, Laurel were around then, but we would, I don't know where it was, some party, beautiful house, giant fireplace. So I sit down on, at the hearth on this big slab of stone and two guys sit down next to me. And it's this guy and Joe Cocker. Mm -hmm. So they're talking and I'm sitting there, oh, fine, it's Joe Cocker. And so I turned it to Joe, the guy gets up and he walks away and Joe turns to me and he says, I said, hey, Joe, Jim Reeves. I said, we, we did a session together in New York. He turns to me and says, you're full of fucking shit. I never did no fucking session in New York in my fucking life. And I went, whoa, <laughs> and I, you know, completely intimidated. I got up and I said, yeah, sorry, and I, and I left. So that's the, the full story of <laughs> my session with Joe yeah. Cocker, which is, it's not unusual to not be known as the engineer on anything. But, sure. But I have the recording. The recording he says he never did. Wow. 